This is a presentation of the Center for Advanced Study at the University of Illinois. For over 50 years, the Center for Advanced Study has brought together scholars from diverse disciplines and backgrounds, encouraging and rewarding excellence in all areas of academic inquiry at Illinois, one of the nation's premier public universities. For more information about this presentation and other center activities, please visit cas.illinois.edu. On behalf of the Center for Latin American Studies, uh, we appreciate your presence here. I would like to thank all the co-sponsors, and especially the Miller Com uh, series lecture that approved this, and especially to our guest speaker that you know uh, respond very quickly to our invitation. And now, you know, this is a very brief presentation. I would like to introduce, on my turn, uh, Professor Andrew Orta, who is the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. Thank you. Well, good evening, and, and thank you all very much for, for joining us here. In addition to thanking the MillerCom Committee and our impressive list of sponsors, let me, let me recognize uh, Angelina Kotler again, the Associate Director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, who did a lot of all of the organizing work, really, to make this happen. So thank you very much, Angelina, for your work. Okay. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure uh, to welcome Professor Juan Mendez to our campus, and it's a real honor to be able to introduce him to you this evening. Professor Mendez joins us most immediately from American University, where he's a visiting professor at the Washington College of Law. He's had an exemplary career as a scholar, as an activist, and as a leader in the field of human rights, with a powerful impact around the world, especially in countries undergoing transitions away from periods of repressive rule, and especially in the Americas. Once designated a prisoner of conscience himself by Amnesty International because of his detention and torture in his native Argentina, Professor Mendez has been a tireless advocate of human rights, serving as General Counsel of Human Rights Watch, Executive Director of the Inter-American Institute of Human Rights, and President of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights of the Organization of American States. From 2004 to 2009, he was president of the International Center for Transitional Justice. And between 2004 and 2007, he also served as special advisor to the Secretary General of the United Nations on the prevention of genocide. As a scholar of international human rights law, Professor Mendez has held teaching positions at Georgetown Law School, the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, and the Oxford Master's Program in International Human Rights Law. He was professor of law and director of the Center for Civil and Human Rights at the University of Notre Dame and a scholar in residence at the Ford Foundation. He has an extensive list of publications in English and in Spanish with imprints from around the world reflecting the international impact of his scholarship and his advocacy. And there's also an impressive list of awards and other honors that rightly go with all of that. Uh, among the most recent is the 2009 Skoll Award for Social Entrepreneurship, received jointly with his colleague at the International Center for Transitional Justice, Paul Von Zeil. And more recently, I'm told by good sources that he recently received, within the past few weeks, the Goler Butcher uh, Lifetime, Achievement, uh, Lifetime Award Recognition for Human Rights from the American Society for International Law. Professor Mendez joins us this evening to address the questions of human rights trials and truth commissions at a time when the United States works to come to grips with the record of torture and other human rights abuses, Professor Mendez challenges us to consider what the United States can learn from the experiences of other nations, and particularly nations in Latin America. So please join me in welcoming Professor Juan Mendez. Thank you very much. I'm very, I'm very um, honored, uh, and I want to uh, uh, express my gratitude to all of you for, for joining us here tonight. Um, uh, uh, what, I need, what I'm going to talk about, about uh, requires a little bit of an explanation because although we use code words uh, for it, uh, code word me being 
transitional justice, it's not the kind of concept that uh, is readily associated with a particular reality. And in fact, it is a misnomer because the principles that uh, inform um, the need to examine uh, legacies of past human rights violations are really not applicable only during a transitional period. They are applicable uh, at any time uh, because they are in, in intrinsic to our notion of human rights and, and, and human dignity. But essentially, transitional justice alludes to the experiences that uh, societies uh, have um, attempted uh, when they are uh, making a transition from dictatorship to democracy or from conflict to peace. And at the same time, they have to reckon with a very heavy legacy of uh, massive uh, and severe human rights abuses. Uh, the, the, just moving on uh, without dealing with the past is just unacceptable to the victims, but it's largely unacceptable to the, uh, to the civil society as a whole. Uh, and so the need to, uh, to deal with the past uh, is basically what has, in the last 25, 27 years, generated a series of experiences um, that, uh, uh, in turn, have also generated some principles of international law that are now widely considered as uh, uh, mandatory for, for uh, states uh, that are willing to respect uh, the rule of law, both domestically and internationally. Um, and in fact, those principles of international law uh, have, um, are, are increasingly upset, accepted by, uh, as obligations by these societies that have become democratic in the last uh, uh, few years. Um, there are obviously uh, moral, political, and legal arguments or reasons for why the, re the, the past has to be dealt with. But I don't want to minimize the fact that it, uh, create, there, there's all kinds of obstacles to dealing with the past, uh, and some arguments uh, that are, that are uh, presented for why it's best just to leave the past alone and not deal with it. Um, I would say that the main uh, moral argument uh, for reckoning with the past is to honor the victims, is to make sure that their sacrifice has not been in vain. And by the victims, I don't mean only the victims that have perished, but also their families, uh, especially in those uh, cases where the families have, made, uh, have been made to suffer uh, because of uh, uncertainty about the fate and whereabouts of their loved ones, uh, our societies owe to the families of the victims some reckoning with what happened. And, um, and uh, that's a first uh, moral obligation, but there are also um, political reasons why dealing with the past is important. And I would say, more than anything, it's because uh, we, we want to make a clean break with the, the dictatorship or the conflict situation that preceded, and we want to signify that in the new democratic order, uh, one, we respect the victims, and two, we respect uh, and we give high importance to the precepts, the, the norms uh, by which we are going to live, and that is that no one is above the law, that that uh, uh, torture is unacceptable, that uh, there are ways to fight violence and crime, but uh, they have to be within the law. And I think that has a lot to do with the quality of the democracy that we want to build. And that's why uh, if we want institutions that are respected, judiciaries that, uh, that have the trust of the citizenry, police bodies that enjoy confidence from the population, then we just cannot simply overlook uh, the recent past and pretend that it didn't happen. Uh, obviously, there are arguments against it. And um, the, 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 the first one is to let bygones be bygones, uh, to, and especially let's not rock the boat because we could have a return to dictatorship, uh, or we can have a, a return to, to armed conflict if we insist too much on justice and on recognition of the violations. Um, I, don't, I don't deny that these arguments can be powerful in, in a given situation, but uh, I hope you'll agree with me that in, in, in the end, 
they represent a sort of a blackmail that, uh, that the perpetrators of abuse are trying to inflict on the societies where they live. Because what they're actually saying is, if you try to investigate or prosecute us, we will do these things over again. Uh, we will fight again in the case of insurgents, but also we will um, commit violence against civilians and against the innocent again. And that's both in the case of insurgents, but also on the so-called forces of order. So that blackmail is something that uh, self-respecting democracy just cannot abide, cannot uh, tolerate. Um, obviously, another argument is reconciliation. And, and uh, I have to say off, uh, right off the bat that I think Reconciliation is the ultimate object of all these exercises, that we really do want the societies to reconcile, even, uh, whether the conflict has been ethnic in character or racial or religious, or it has been ideological or political. Countries do need to overcome those uh, conflicts and to uh, truly reconcile with each other. But it's what, what is unacceptable is to decree that reconciliation has already happened and nothing needs to be done about the past, that, uh, that we should just forget, forgive and forget, because uh, some authority orders us to forgive and forget. In fact, true reconciliation happens when there is atonement, when there is uh, recognition of the wrong, when there is apology to the victims. And all of that can happen only if we reckon with the past. It, it, it just does not happen by itself, and much less by decree. Um, and then, of course, there are, there are legal obstacles. Uh, first of all, amnesties, and they come in various forms. Some are self-amnesties. Uh, military governments, before leaving office, generally decree for themselves an amnesty so that they can be protected. And they then pretend that the succeeding government has to respect it under a variety of principles of criminal law that, of course, are very worth uh, respecting. Then there are other types of amnesties that are kind of imposed on the newly de democratic states by military establishment that retain a lot of power and that flex their muscle and say, either you give us an amnesty or we're going to stage another coup. And in both cases, if the amnesty has the effect of making it impossible to investigate the, the past, uh, then they are uh, now very widely established in by many different uh, uh, organs of international law that such an amnesty is unacceptable. It's contrary to treaties and, and, uh, and, and, and international law obligations of the state. But in the meantime, you have to fight the legal battle inside, uh, inside the country and then eventually take it to, uh, to, a, to another level, to an international forum. Um, but there's also uh, other legal obstacles, like statutes of limitations and just the passage of time. And quite frankly, the, the lack of capacity by the judiciaries to deal with very complex uh, crimes of this sort. So all of those are, are serious obstacles, but uh, they're not, they're not uh, overwhelming. They can be overcome if there's political will and if there's uh, serious interest in uh, settling the, 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 the problems with the legacies of human rights abuse. And that is basically what has happened in Latin America dur during the last 25 years, uh, but mostly uh, unknown outside of Latin America, or not, or not well known anyway. And it, uh, it has resulted, as I said earlier, in principles of international law that are widely accepted. I won't, I won't go into the details as to where the decisions have been found, but I, would, I will say, uh, I will mention one turning point, two turning points. The first one is in, in the year 2001, when the Inter-American Court of Human Rights uh, said that the, the amnesties passed by Fujimori uh, in order to protect the clandestine military uh, units that perpetrated the massacre of Barrio Saltos, um, uh, th that those amnesties were contrary to Peru's obligations under the American Convention on Human Rights. And it's remarkable, not it wasn't the first time that the Inter-American Court said that amnesties of that sort are contrary to international law, but it was the first time that, it, that the, the court went, went further and said, and Peru has the obligation of denying or de depriving those laws 
of any legal effect in the domestic jurisdiction. So it's not only that you're violating international law, you have to correct that within the domestic jurisdiction. And to everybody's surprise, uh, well, it wasn't that surprising because Fujimori was no longer in power, but um, uh, the, the matter went to the Supreme Court of Peru, and the Supreme Court of Peru said, if the Inter-American Court says so, we are obliged. And the case of Barrios Altos was reopened, and some of the main culprits or the main suspects were rearrested, including a general who had been the chief of intelligence during the Fujimori regime. Uh, Barrios Altos is one of the two or three or four cases for which Fujimori himself has been found guilty and sentenced to 25 years in prison in, a, in an exemplary judicial process conducted within uh, the judiciary of Peru and that has just been ratified unanimously by the Supreme Court of Peru. So <clears throat> that's one, my, my, one of my turning points. The other one is uh, that these uh, decisions of the Inter-American Court, there are some in the European Court of Human Rights as well that go in the same direction. There are many by uh, United Nations organs of protection of human rights. But they, have, they also gave ground eventually in the 90s to the creation of tribunals like the International, uh, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and the International Court for Rwanda, in both of which the United States was a major actor, a major proponent of um, these tribunals to, to deal with genocide and crimes against humanity and war crimes. But in 1998, the second turning point is the approval in Rome of the statute for the creation of an international criminal court. And it's not just because it creates an instrument of a permanent nature to deal with uh, impunity when countries are unwilling or unable to uh, live up to their obligations. It is also because in signing and ratifying this uh, statute, countries pledge the, to, co uh, to cooperate with each other and to uh, oblige themselves to make sure that impunity for that kind of crime does not prevail. Um, so there's, there is essentially a new paradigm in international relations that has to do with how we deal with legacies of very serious human rights abuse. And it, mean, it means basically, first, that impunity is just unacceptable. And second, that in order to respond adequately, uh, obviously, first and foremost, the states have to prosecute, investigate, prosecute, and punish at least those bearing the highest responsibility for human rights crimes. But prosecutions by themselves are not going to be enough. There also has to be an, a, a concerted effort to discover the truth and reveal it. There's a, there has to be a program of reparations to the victims. And there has to be institutional reform in the sense that the institutions that have been the vehicle for human rights violations, like the police, the armed forces, sometimes the judiciary or the prosecutor's office, offices, have to be reformed extensively by several means so that in the future they are no longer uh, the vehicles for human rights violations. Those are basically the principles that we uh, call uh, <coughs> transitional justice, which is kind of a specialized part of what we call the international law of human rights. But now let me move to uh, how these principles that I have, uh, uh, and experiences that I've sketched only very uh, superficially, how uh, they may uh, offer some lessons to be applied in the United States in the context of what are we going to do about the abuses um, that have happened in the, context, in the context of the global war on terror after 9-11. But first let me say that uh, there are comparisons and there are similarities, but there's also profound differences. I don't by any means want to uh, make the case that what happened in Argentina during the dirty war or in Chile under Pinochet is comparable to the violations uh, that have happened in the, in the global war on terror since 2001. But first, the background of terrorism and political violence that was not invited by the United States in the case of uh, Al-Qaeda is also a background that existed in those countries. Uh, there's obviously uh, ideological reasons why uh, the military in Chile under Pinochet and in Argentina and in Peru under Fujimori committed the atrocities. 
but they also had the excuse or the reason behind it that they needed to confront a very violent and very vicious uh, series of challenges by armed groups. Um, so there, there's more of a similarity, if you will, than a difference. But in the United States, there was never a breakdown of the constitutional order, or the, uh, 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 there was never an attempt to take over uh, the institutions of the state, like there was in just about every Latin American country. And that's an important uh, um, difference, although obviously there were some attempts to subvert the, 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 um, uh, <clears throat> the role of the U.S. courts, for example, by uh, you know, keeping prisoners outside of U.S. Uh, territory so that federal courts would not have jurisdiction. But that is not comparable to a coup d'etat. And, and I, I think we need to have that uh, difference in mind. Also, in the United States, there was generally a very good reaction by the civil society, first and foremost, uh, trying to resist these incursions into uh, uh, the constitutional norms that have always been uh, applicable in the United States. And uh, some of these organizations have done a great job of uh, putting some limits on what otherwise could have been a lot worse. In Latin America, by and large, at the moment when the worst violations were occurring, there were some very courageous people, too. But they, they run enormous risks. And, and by and large, the, the society was not in a position to offer the kind of resistance that was offered here. And that resulted in. I think, an exemplary uh, response by the courts, generally. Uh, you have to remember that there have been basically four Supreme Court decisions uh, dealing with um, uh, different aspects of the war on terror, and all four of them went against uh, the Bush administration. So uh, it's, a, it's an important thing to remember, that at least, uh, uh, you know, and we can disagree with parts of the decisions, but the fact that an independent judiciary is still overseeing uh, the commission of, of, of some of these uh, uh, violations is, is a big difference that one has to bear in mind. <clears throat> There's also been more media exposure at the time, in real time, of, these, uh, of, of some of these atrocities than, than was the case in Latin America in our years. And so all of that means that uh, the pressure to, uh, to investigate uh, and prosecute and punish the crimes of the past uh, is different in the sense that there, there's uh, much less, um, you know, to be uh, much less need for a concerted effort to to discover the truth uh, than what uh, than the legacies that we faced when we did, did transitions to democracy in Latin America. And um, it, there's also one important difference, and that the patterns of violations are different you know, uh, by, uh, in, in, in scale and in numbers also of victims. And one important consideration that shouldn't be a consideration, but unfortunately it is, is that the victims are all people we don't know. They're not Americans. They're, uh, by and large, there's one or two cases, but uh, by and large they're people whose names we don't want even to try to pronounce, uh, whose faces we don't know, who did not live around us. And so that means that the society is much less inclined to defend their own like they, they, they are inclined in Latin America because after all, the atrocities were committed against uh, the nationals of the same country. So that means basically um, um, that, that uh, the, the, it's not possible or, or even desirable in the United States simply to copy some of the experience with truth commissions, with you know, mega prosecutions, uh, like was, was, was done in some Latin American countries, or with, even with reparations. Uh, in the United States, we have to find uh, different ways of dealing with this legacy. But a legacy it is, and we just cannot ignore it. And it's a legacy, if not very numerous, at least of very systematic violations. Because for all we know, and we don't know a lot, but we do, we do know some of what happened. This was not uh, anecdotal. This was not rogue people going out of uh, you know of their uh, remit and doing things that they shouldn't be uh, doing. This was all very much concerted, thought through, organized, ordered, and implemented by uh, apparently by very uh, higher echelons 
of, uh, of, of the government of the United States. And I would say uh, that uh, uh, the features of what uh, went on are gen generally well known, but for, all, for, all, for each of them, we can say that they constitute violations not only of constitutional law and of traditions of this country, but also of international obligations of the United States. And one of them is the resort to uh, prolonged arbitrary detention without trial. I remember when Rumsfeld said uh, in the height of his power that it was silly for people to complain that we were taking people to Guantanamo. After all, we're not holding people there for five years. Well, it's now more than five years, and they're still there. And uh, it was clear then, of course, that they were going to be there for five or more years if it was up to, to Rumsfeld. But it's a question of uh, prolonged arbitrary detention. And I, I realize that there are arguments, uh, but there are arguments that have to do with this conception of war against terror that then becomes no, not a euphemism or a, or a misnomer for you know, a series of actions that have to be conducted against terrorism, but uh, an excuse for applying principles of the law of war that are supposed to apply to a very discrete war between a state and another state that happens in a, in a period of time and in a, in a special territory. And in those circumstances, there's no doubt that the belligerence of one uh, state can arrest and hold without trial the belligerence of the other state for as long as hostilities continue. There, I think, there, there's no doubt that that is legitimate. And in fact, it's a very humanitarian thing because you don't prosecute them because they're just enemy combatants and you don't want your people to be prosecuted if they are captured. You have to treat them well, etc. And whether you give them prisoner of war status or not is also a different question. But when you define war in this open-ended way that it happens everywhere and anywhere and that the combatants are everybody uh, and it doesn't matter whether you capture them in the battlefield or whether they're handed to you by the security uh, agencies of another state and it doesn't really matter whether they were fighting with arms or they were you know, providing some kind of political or, or uh, monetary or financial support to the enemy, you treat them as, uh, as belligerents, then you know, the consequence of that is that because the war against terror is not going to end any time soon, and it's going to be a theater of war that is undefined, is that basically you're engaging in prolonged arbitrary detention without trial. And that is a very serious violation of, uh, of, uh, of, of international human rights uh, principles and international human rights law. Um, I want to mention uh, another couple of, uh, of instances, but, but before leaving prolonged arbitrary detention, uh, as you know, the Obama administration is considering limiting, but still using preventive detention, as it's called. Um, again, if it's limited to, uh, to combat-related situations, it's probably not illegal and probably not a bad thing to do. Uh, but at the same time, even for those uh, situations, we need to have safeguards. We need to have safeguards that some independent authority, not the president, is going to examine the reasons for each individual to be held or not held and to be uh, released if there's no, reasons, uh, no reason to hold them. And in that sense, we fortunately have one of the four decisions that I mentioned by the Supreme Court, the Boumediene decision, the most recent of the four, that actually says that you cannot deprive prisoners in Guantanamo or in any place where the United States holds them from recourse to habeas corpus. It's, it's amazing that we had to, have to, we had to go to the Supreme Court to say that a right like habeas corpus had to be uh, defended by the Supreme Court. But now we have that. We have that decision. And I hope that if the United States is going to use preventive detention, it's going to be under those safeguards with a, real, a, a periodic review of the circumstances of each detention, not a categorical point that says everybody has to be detained because everybody is an enemy combatant, but a, a specific determination for each case, periodically reviewed, and the more that time passes with more stringent uh, characteristics of, of the review. 
Um, I hope that that's going to be uh, how the problem of prolonged arbitrary detention is going to be resolved. The other issue, the other feature, and perhaps it's even more serious, is the treatment in detention. Now we, we know the torture memos, and we know that they, they weren't just memos, that torture actually did occur. Whether you want to you know, parse the meaning of words and call it something else, there's just no question now that some people were uh, subjected to uh, very serious abuses, uh, physical and psychological as well. And torture is, uh, and when practiced in a systematic or widespread way, a crime against humanity. And when it, when it, a crime against humanity has to be investigated, prosecuted, and punished. Um, <clears throat> the good thing is that under the Obama administration, we know that the practice has ended. We know that the, 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 on, the, on his first day in office, President Obama restored the applicability of the Uniform, Co Uniform Code of Military Justice that specifically prohibits torture under any circumstance. And for all we know, there are no exceptions to that. It's not happening now. But that's not enough. What happened in the past has to be clarified, investigated, uh, you know, followed, the, plea, the, the, the leads followed to wherever they take us. And there has been some uh, interesting uh, developments, like some congressional investigations that are uh, quite interesting, uh, but they are incomplete. And um, there's been, uh, uh, there was uh, an attempt to create some kind of commission of inquiry into this, but unfortunately, uh, that idea has died down. It's not going to happen, at least not as an official commission, and not anytime soon. But I think, quite frankly, that it's, uh, it's uh, urgent for civil society to organize, uh, if not an official one, at least an unofficial inquiry of a serious nature and, uh, and, and with respected, respectable people that actually clarifies uh, the treatment of detainees as far as it has gone. Um, then there's renditions. And for all we know, extraordinary renditions, as they were euphemistically called, are no longer happening. Renditions to justice is a different question. They, they seem to still happen. And quite frankly, renditions to justice, meaning you know, uh, taking somebody over to another country without going through the motions of extradition, is probably not um, contrary to international law if, in fact, the receiving country is actually going to prosecute, invest, investigate, prosecute, and punish, and do it uh, with uh, full respect for uh, norms of fair trial and due process of law. So renditions as such are not the problem, but the so-called extraordinary renditions were very different because they were, they were uh, de uh, delivering people to countries where they were going to be tortured. They were not going to be prosecuted. They were going to be interrogated under torture. And it was absolutely hypocritical of the United States at the time to claim that they, they had sought uh, diplomatic assurances that they were not going to be tortured. Because quite frankly, why would the United States deliver uh, a so-called high value detainee to another country that is known to practice torture if it wasn't for that person to be tortured and the information to be given back to uh, United States intelligence agencies. It's, uh, fortunately, that doesn't seem to be happening now. But the fact that it happened, that it happened to a variety of people, dozens, apparently, of people, that we don't yet know exactly where they were tortured and by whom, and who gave orders to, to let those people be tortured is something that is still need, needs to be explored and investigated. Fortunately, it looks also like we're not using black sites anymore. That's similar to renditions, but instead, they were not taken to any other country, but uh, they were taken to secret detention centers run by the CIA in different parts of the world. Uh, for all we know, that's not happening now, and that's uh, very important. But again, like in the other aspects, it's not enough just to stop the practice. We need to investigate what happened and who gave the orders and, and why, and then let justice run its course. And if, if we have to prosecute people, they should be prosecuted, obviously, with all guarantees of due process, but they have to be prosecuted. And then there's finally trials and uh, the use of military courts. There again, we have the help of the, of the Supreme Court in already twice striking down 
different forms of military commissions. Um, but the Obama administration is reviewing all of this, but it but seems to be retaining at least some possibility of using military commissions. Again, if they are used for people who were caught in battle and they are used to prosecute uh, war crimes, that is, violations of the laws of war, that's not, that's not illegal. It doesn't infringe any international law uh, principle, and it should be done. If, however, they are used much more in a much more discretionary way to combatants and non-combatants alike, then there's a serious problem with due process, and particularly with the independence and impartiality of the adjudicator. And quite frankly, there's no reason why uh, federal courts cannot be used. In fact, during the Bush administration, there were more federal courts, uh, um, prosecutions of terrorist suspects, uh, than, than military commissions uh, um, cases. And uh, no one felt that the federal courts of this country were not capable of dealing fairly, uh, but also severely, with uh, uh, terrorist crimes. So, um, and finally, my, my final feature is a question of potential violations of the loss of war committed in the two theaters of war, Afghanistan and uh, Iraq. Now, I want to start by saying that I don't know that anybody is responsible for war crimes. What all I am saying is that we have not seen a serious investigation of the many incidents in which, for example, many civilians have been killed. Um, wedding parties that have been bombed, perhaps by mistake, we don't know. But we, if, if civilians die, we should, I, I don't say that we should use it as a presumption that a, that a, crime, a war crime has been committed, but it's an inference and it, it behooves us to be very serious about how we investigate them. There, the numbers of civilians that have died in Iraq and Afghanistan is staggering. At some point, we even stopped counting them. And that's just unacceptable. I mean, we just, it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that every time a civilian dies, that's a war crime. Because under the loss of war, sometimes civilians are indeed collateral damage because the attack is legitimate, the target is legitimate, the rule of proportionality that is basically weighs the military advantage to the risk of the harm to civilian has been respected, and all of that makes it an acceptable cost of war. But if we don't investigate them, it means basically that we are uh, uh, abandoning a major obligation that uh, the Geneva Conventions impose on any fighting force anywhere in the world, and that the United States has always respected, by the way. So, I think it's, it, it, with wars going on, it's going to be very difficult to get the Pentagon to investigate these incidents uh, seriously. But I think at some point we're going to need to reckon with it. And, we, and uh, it's going, we are all going to feel a lot better about them after the investigations are serious. Right now, for example, the ACLU, uh, using the Freedom of Information Act, obtained documents of how some uh, cases were investigated in Iraq where civilians had died, and there were like 60 some cases, uh, and in all but three, the investigation had been very cursory and, 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 and had been closed within days without any serious investigation. And in those cases, those three that proceeded to the next stage, the most that had happened was basically a slap in the wrist to very low-lying, low-ranking uh, uh, people responsible for them without any attempt to investigate uh, up the chain of command. And uh, in some cases, in fact, with the orders given to investigators not to talk to witnesses, for example, not to ask questions that may lead to uh, other people being involved. So very disappointing ways of doing investigations, and, and uh, we, we really need to, to look it, into them in more serious ways. In, in the end, all I'm saying is that we need more transparency with respect to civilian deaths everywhere. Main, the main discussion today is about targeting. And as you know, there are drone attacks in Pakistan, in, in the Middle East, etc. If they are targeting people who are clearly heads of Al-Qaeda, it's probably not a violation of the laws of war because you don't have to try to arrest everybody. You, you can surprise somebody and kill him if he's a combatant. 
But again, if, you're, if in killing a major Al-Qaeda leader you also kill 40 civilians, then the rule of proportionality, which is a Geneva Convention rule, may be infringed. And there we need to be much more careful about how we target, and even after we target and commit the attack, then investigating it honestly, transparently, seriously, so that the rest of us can be comfortable with the fact that, yeah, there may have been civilian casualties, but they were clearly inevitable. Now, going all the way back to uh, accountability for human rights violations in Latin America, it's important to note that the United States always demands accountability from other, from other nations. In fact, every year this, the, the State Department writes country reports on human rights practices in all of the world. And even this year, uh, they've just published them, and they deal with questions of accountability for human rights abuses by all other countries. So I'm not saying that they should write a report about the United States, that's not the purpose, but they should use the same, the government should use the same yardstick by which it judges other nations to our own activities uh, in the global war on terror. But transitional justice mechanisms are not a blueprint, they're not a, a, a one size fits all. The United States has to find the mechanisms that make sense in the legal traditions of the United States. And there's plenty of exercises, some better than others, but the United States has conducted uh, congressional inquiries, for example, um, uh, the Church Committee in the 70s, the Iran-Contra inquiry uh, in the 80s. So there's experience, and there are, there are things to be improved upon and things that, uh, that can be, um, uh, you know, reenacted uh, with a lot of benefit. So uh, my point is not so much that the United States should follow the lead of Latin America or South Africa or the many countries around the world that are doing transitional justice mechanisms, because I insist the United States has to find its own way, ways. But I do insist that the principles that are, that are the objectives of these uh, transitional justice mechanisms, that is, getting to the bottom of the truth, uh, establishing liabilities where they lie, you know, up the chain of command and down the chain of command as well, uh, even reaching civilian authorities if necessary, the uh, reparations to the victims, and institutional reform where, where necessary, those principles are valid for the United States as they are for all countries in the world. The case of institutional reform, I would say that fortunately in the United States it's, it's less necessary because it's been very encouraging to see that so many military leaders actually res, uh, resisting the orders uh, and the solutions, quote unquote, created by the Bush administration. I would not say the same about the CIA where probably reform is necessary because we just don't know um, who ordered what and who did what. But in the, in, the, in the Defense Department, there's plenty of traditions to go back to and rely upon. And, and by and large, especially um, the JAG uh, units, the, 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 the military lawyers of the United States, have been in the forefront of uh, uh, standing up for the rule of law, even in combat situations. And, and I think that's a tradition that uh, gives, gives, gives us some hope that we can go back on the right track uh, and, um, and uh, make sure that even a tragedy as bad as 9-11 does not undermine those traditions that have served this country well for so many years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Mendes, for a really enlightening talk. Uh, I was wondering whether you could say a little bit more about the longer-term consequences of the Truth and uh, uh, Reconciliation uh, Commissions in uh, Latin America. You, you suggested that uh, they initiated legal reforms and, and uh, changes in international law. Um, do you have any sense uh, 
to which degree uh, these changes have uh, become real reforms within the institutions and yeah. that there's some kind of a longer term uh, change that, that has come out of them for these countries. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, um, the information is anecdotal at best and, uh, and, uh, and varied. I mean, it, it, the degrees of transformation uh, are not the same in every country. Uh, but I can say one thing, for example, uh, the military of El Salvador is you know, vastly reformed from what it was during the war. The military of Argentina is very, very changed. I think even the, the Chilean military uh, has uh, overcome the Pinochet years uh, and is very respectful, respectful of constitutional order now. I, I would say that's uh, less true of the Peruvian military, but uh, the exercises in in accountability in Peru are more recent, so we, we may expect in the future for that to happen. The Guatemalan military is unrepentant. Um, and uh, it's, it's not so much the reform of the institution itself, but its impact on the quality of democracy. And I don't have any way of proving it myself because uh, there's so many factors that go into it, but I, I am convinced that because we had truth-telling, because we had prosecutions of the juntas, for example, in Argentina, because we offered reparations to the victims, because we tried to re reform the institutions, it is now much less possible in Latin America to expect interruptions of a constitutional order. And it's because you have to understand that the coups didn't happen only because of some ru uh, ruthless you know, uh, military wanting to impose their views on everybody else, it happened also because they had some civilian support. And that civilian support is just no longer there. there even in, the, in my country where we have gone through incredibly tumultuous, you know, economic turmoil in 2001, uh, there was not even the hint that we should have a coup. There was not, and, and the reason is that people understand that bad as things can be in a democracy, the alternative of military rule is so much worse that it's not even worth trying. And I say this anecdotally, but there, is, there are some studies. Uh, there's a par particularly a professor um, in political science from the University of Minnesota called Catherine Sicking, who has written several different essays and conducted research. And she demonstrates, I think pretty convincingly, that those countries that did more about reckoning with the past have performed better as democracies as well. And again, I don't mean to over, uh, overestimate the point because for a variety of reasons, Argentina is a very stable democracy, but the democracy is very uh, disappointing in many different ways. And I'm not saying that it's a model democracy in any sense. But I think the legacies of uh, you know, reckoning frankly and honestly with the past uh, not only stabilize democracy, but create the expectation of, in the citizenry about what they want from their institutions that then serves to create trust and confidence in institutions like the judiciary, like prosecutor's office, offices, that really make for uh, what uh, the rule of law is all about and, 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 and make you at least more hopeful that those institutions will one day uh, serve their country a lot better than they have in the past. And I have to say that this is not only true of Latin America, it's true of many different countries that have tried to look at the, at the past honestly. Say, for example, Sierra Leone. I mean, it went through the most vicious internal war, uh, and it, it attempted at uh, forgive and forget in the Lome Accord of 1999 with uh, an amnesty that was so blanket that it uh, forgave uh, Fodai Sanko for you know, literally chopping the arms of young kids and, of, uh, and taking uh, young women into s sexual slavery. Six months later, six months after that peace accord, he was fighting again and he was committing the same crimes again. But now afterwards, when it was done the right way and a, and a, and a truth commission and a tribunal were created to look into the atrocities committed by all parties to the conflict. Sierra Leone is one of the poorest countries in the world, but it is stable. It's not going to go back to conflict. And it's going to have a future 
because people now believe in truth and believe in justice and believe in peace born out of justice, not peace imposed by those who blackmail us into giving them impunity. Uh, I think that's obviously, uh, I am Argentine and I live in the United States, so far from me to say uh, how other countries should live their lives. But I think, quite frankly, the experience of South Africa is exemplary in many different ways. But it's exemplary not because it, uh, it was so much based on reconciliation, but that it tried to create reconciliation by examining the past. And uh, there are some shortcomings and some reasons to be less unhappy with the outcome, but the effort itself is enormously beneficial, not only to South Africa, but to, as an example, to many other African and extracontinental countries as well. Sorry to be so long-winded. <laughs> yes, please. There was no, there was no uh, official investigation of torture in Brazil. You haven't mentioned Brazil very much, but I'm wondering what, what you think of the quality of uh, Brazilian democracy after 1988, uh, despite the fact that the Brazilian military, uh, uh, their crimes was, was prevented from being okay. um, think. researched in any way. Right. Well, uh, Brazil is one of those countries that has done the least around uh, accountability. Uh, and it's in part because the military, as you know, retains uh, a high level of autonomy and of power, even though the democracy has performed as well as it has uh, in the, since 1988. But a couple of caveats to that. Uh, in the 90s, there was an attempt to look at, at uh, a part particular incident called the Guerrilla do Araguaia, in which a truth commission that was more or less flawed was created and reparations were offered to the families of these people who were killed after capture by the army essentially uh, in, a, uh, in a rural guerrilla experiment. Um, that case itself has been revitalized now as we speak. And uh, President Lula has set up a task force to advise him on the advisability of creating a truth commission. Uh, very early steps. But I had the privilege of being invited to brief that task force just last month in Sao Paulo. And I was very impressed with the seriousness with, with which this, this task force is uh, confronting this. In addition, there are some prosecutors that have filed a case uh, for overcoming the, the self-amnesty law of the military in a notorious case of the 70s in which a well-known journalist uh, uh, was, uh, was murdered, uh, was actually killed in torture. Uh, and that, that case and the guerrilla of Araguaia, I, I understand they, they are before the Supreme Court, the Supreme Tribunal um, of Brazil, to determine whether the amnesty stands or not or whether prosecutions uh, will be opened or not. You also may know that this, all of these things, uh, stirrings, if you will, because they're not final decisions yet, have met with lots of resistance. But I'm encouraged to have learned that when the chief of the army, just last December, I think it was, uh, actually said publicly that he was opposed to a truth commission, President Lula uh, uh, demoted him and, and replaced him by somebody else, which is a show of civilian authority over military uh, uh, institutions that uh, bodes well, I think, for the future of democracy in Brazil. Now, is there going to be accountability in Brazil? It's very much open to question because so much time has elapsed. But Brazil, I mean, Uruguay is another country that did very little around these things. But last November, the Supreme Court of Uruguay uh, declared the, the, the law of caducidad, as it's called, uh, you know, the pseudo-amnesty law of Uruguay, unconstitutional for violating treaty obligations of Uruguay as well. And besides, uh, there are many exceptions to that law, so, that, so some prosecutions are going on in Uruguay as well. So I think this, this whole th uh, issue is moving everywhere, including in Brazil. Uh, but, you know, is it going to uh, result in serious uh, breaking of the cycle of, imp of impunity? It's very early to tell. Earlier, there is the argument that out there that these tribunals um, are detrimental to allowing countries to move on and move past these things. So I was just wondering if 
there's a system of checks or events that we can recognize during these tribunals that let us know reform has been instituted and that you know the victims um, have been shown their respect. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you that ideally, this, all of these things, the four principles that I mentioned, should happen in a given time frame, and then after that we should all look forward. Unfortunately, things are not as neat as, it, as, as we would want them to be. And the reason tribunals uh, take so long first has to do with the political will of people who impose their will for impunity and insist on amnesties, insist on de facto impunity, uh, or get the president to give them pardons, for example, even before they are tried. And then you have, you have to go through several years of, of political struggle to reenact uh, and, re and insist on measures that, uh, that break the cycle of impunity eventually. And the second reason why they take so long is because we don't have the privilege of giving them summary judgments, and we shouldn't. We have to give them fair trials. The same kind of fair trials that they refuse to give to their victims, we have to give them. And if they use every trick in the book, if every appeal, every you know, uh, recourse to, uh, to, to, to um, defenses that they may have, we have to let them use it. And by and large, many of the long, uh, the long trials uh, have, have happened because of that. They've been uh, mostly due to the, the defendants using every defense that they have. But that's fine. They should be able to do that. And then the third reason is that uh, even when there is a lot of political will, countries just move kind of willy-nilly into, yeah, let's prosecute them, without realizing that these are serious crimes, they are complex, they need serious investigations. You need to prepare prosecutors and courts to do them the right way. And all of a sudden you had the, 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 crowd, uh, the, the courts are clogged with all these cases and nobody knows very much how to organize and do them right. And here I'm talking of, of Argentina, which I think is going the farthest, perhaps together with Chile, in prosecuting every crime of the, of, of the dirty war. But it's not doing, and only now is beginning to do it in a more organized fashion. But for years, it was all political will and very little smart thinking about what it, what it will take to do it the right way. Um, and in the meantime, these courts, these trials can suffer of very serious vulnerabilities because if you have somebody waiting 10 years to be declared innocent or guilty, then we're really violating his rights as well. I'm not saying that that has already happened, but it's a vulnerability. It could happen. Okay. You can go to the Thank you. microphone. So I have two, two questions. The first is, do you, and you mentioned this, I think obviously one of the problems in the U.S., it would be that the violations occur to non-U.S. citizens. And so who cares? Right, it's very different from Argentina because what were you going to do? Were you going to kill all the mothers that were there? Yeah. You know, they were Argentinian citizens. Right. So, is there any other case where you know this type of process, where this type of process started, and you know, concerning non-citizens? Th that's the first part of the question. And the second, you say that these processes are moving all over the world. What, what do you think of Spain, where it seems to be moving backwards? Uh, particularly in relation to the now persecution of Jue Juez Baltasar Garzón, who might have started the persecution against Pinochet, but is now being actually persecuted mm -hmm. for crimes against Francoism or for stepping out, you know, technically for stepping outside the boundaries of his authority. And he's being, you know, this is being accepted by the Spanish, uh, you know, uh, judiciary. So those right. are the two questions. Thank you. Well, for, uh, I, first, let me make it clear that uh, I, I, I was just stating uh, a fact, not a value judgment. I think we owe it to the victims, whether they are our neighbors and our friends and our loved ones, but also because they're victims. And so, it, it, but it's just a, a, a fact of life that we are going to care less about what happens to people we don't know than what happens to people that we identify as one of us. And that means that there's much less of a groundswell of support for doing the right thing because the victims are not one of us. Uh, but I, I, I'm not, I'm not in, in any way suggesting that the obligation and our obligation to, 
to uh, insist on accountability is any less because they are not one of us. On the contrary, uh, I think we do this because we honor the victims, but also because we honor the, the norm, the principle that these things should not happen. Now, with respect to other countries, um, I think, for example, that uh, countries that have participated in these coalitions of the willings with uh, the United States have been a little more open, I wouldn't say perfect, but a little more open and transparent about investigating violations committed by their own in the theaters of war. Uh, for example, Moreno Campo, the, the prosecutor for the ICC, had jurisdiction only over the UK in Iraq because uh, the UK is a signatory to the Rome Statute and non, none of the other participants were. And he actually looked at some of these violations, but he found that Britain was actually honestly and seriously dealing in the domestic jurisdiction with investigations of whatever British soldiers had done in Iraq. And so under the rules of the ICC, he declined to take the case. So that seems to show to me that at least in those cases, Britain was doing the right thing. So it's not impossible to do it even when there's no groundswell of support in the British society for whatever happened in Iraq uh, against Iraqi citizens. But, but those are rare cases. Uh, by and large, the countries where we have done transitional justice have been in, in, domestic, in domestic conflicts. And they, they have happened because we care about you know, what happens to our own. And um, the, with respect to Spain, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's uh, outrageous that Baltasar Garzón is being uh, prosecuted, or not prosecuted, but uh, investigated for uh, what in Spanish is called prevaricato, which is the crime that a judge commits when he violates his trust, his, his, uh, his duties as judge. For saying only that he was, he was, he was trying to uh, find where some clandestine graves of victims of the Civil War and of the Franco era, uh, they were, for the purposes of identifying the remains and giving them to their families and not necessarily to prosecute anybody because he hadn't even gotten that far. Uh, I, I can understand the ideological, fascistic motivation of the people who filed the case. I just can't understand the courts even giving this more than 24 hours worth of notice. It's just ridiculous. But, you know, Garçon is a, a very contentious, very controversial judge, and there must be people out to get him. That's all I can say. It's really outrageous. But... With respect to, to Spain, you, one has to understand that Spain tried to do the opposite of Latin America and pretend that, we can, that Franco can decide for, the, for all Spanish people whether there's going to be accountability or not. And uh, the democratic period after Franco mostly lived within that, but it's crumbling. Uh, there are descendants of the victims who are still crying out to know what happened to them. They, they still know... Uh, they still want to know where the bodies uh, were hidden and all that. And this is a kind of demand that is not going to go away. It's not going to die. And so uh, the government of Spain, the parliament of Spain, actually passed a law only two years ago of historical memory that doesn't go nearly far enough along the lines of what I said, but it is an important uh, measure of recognition that the past cannot be buried. Uh, so even in Spain, you know, that is always, pre was always in the 80s presented to us as, why don't you do like Spain and forgive and forget? Even in Spain, it's not that easy to say forgive and forget. Yes, uh, I have two hands, but. I have a quick um, question about, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about what the United States is currently doing or plans to do regarding the human rights violations committed by Blackwater. Um, by Blackwater? Okay. Yes, because they're a private military and they don't, I guess, they're, they're, how the law applies to them is going to be different, I suppose, from how it would apply to the human rights violations committed by um, just the army or the U.S. military. Yeah. And my second, I have another question is, um, regarding the School of the Americas, I believe they've changed their name now to reflect something more positive. But um, with respect to how they train and the ideology that they um, impart on the, 
I suppose the soldiers that are coming from Latin America that they're training, and that they then send back. Now these soldiers commit human rights violations. And so we can have tribunals, we can have you know, uh, prosecutions against them that I suppose maybe the country of Colombia can start. Um, but what do we do about the School of the Americas? I mean, they share a responsibility for the atrocities. So do you, what can be done? Do you prosecute okay. the School of the Americas? How exactly does this, because this is a problem for the US. And so the US is involved in some way. Um, so it seems to me like you can't just, who would do the prosecuting? Colombia, like, or a Latin American country, or would have to start internally here? Um, so if you could just enlighten us on that, that would be great. Thank you. About Blackwater, uh, there is a big issue about uh, violations committed by so-called contractors that are not, uh, not, as, not specifically state agents, um, and they've been mostly employed both in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, under international law, there's no question that the United States has the responsibility for whatever they do, because they are contractors. They are, they are given authority by, the, United, by the, the, the Pentagon, by the Defense Department, to do things that ordinarily should be done by official agents of the United States, like soldiers, officers, etc. cetera. Um, I, I, I have no idea of whether they're still being used or not, but I think they were discontinued. Um, the thing is that investigation of their activities has not proceeded very far either, and so I would put it in the same category as the kind of things we need to know uh, and that, needs to be, that need to be investigated uh, further before we can reach any conclusion about who's responsible for what in them. But the fact that they are independent contractors does not excuse the responsibility of the government, of the state, of the United States vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, or, of the, or under the constitution of the, whoever contracted them, in this case, uh, the Defense Department. Uh, with respect to the School of the Americas, uh, many of these uh, truth-telling exercises did deal with, uh, you know, uh, with re uh, re relationships that the, the perpetrators of abuse had with uh, military assistance from abroad, including the United States, but not only from the United States. But by and large, when they tried, they, if, if they had tried to blame it all on the School of the Americas, they would have missed the point. Because my sense is that um, you don't need to be taught to torture. You, you learn to torture by, by yourself. And uh, these people did not need much incentive. It's still very bad policy, to say the least, and even immoral uh, to, train, uh, to train soldiers that you know are going to commit these kind of atrocities. But we've never really known what is it that they, train, that they taught uh, in the School of the Americas. And that, that's aside from other more secret training that may have happened elsewhere. But in the School of the Americas, it was very public, and uh, it's very difficult to know what the syllabi was, what the curriculum was. Uh, what we do know, however, is that the worst elements of Latin America passed through the School of the Americas, and some of them have been put in, their, their photographs have been put in a so-called Hall of Fame. And it includes Banzer, for example, who led a bloody coup in Bolivia. Uh, it includes several people who committed atrocities all throughout Latin America. And the school itself has been more or less unrepentant of that role. So I don't know that we can do anything because I don't think they, what, what they did at the School of the Americas, now at Fort Bragg, uh, constitutes a crime under either any law of, of Latin America or the laws of the United States. But I do think that we need to publicize this uh, to, to cry out for some reform of it, uh, to, to make sure that rela military relations between the Pentagon and Latin American militaries are respectful of democracy and human rights, that if there's going to be relationships, they should be respectful of uh, civilian authority, for example, and particularly that they should send a clear message that atrocities are just uh, not tolerated, not uh, celebrated, not, uh, not proposed, uh, not, not encouraged by the School of the Americas. Yes. You um, talked about holding the United States, we hold ourselves to a same standard or hopefully a higher standard than we hold other people in the world. 
Um, where does something like the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights fit into this? I mean, as I understand it, the United States is a signatory. I'm, I'm sure it doesn't have the rule of law, but it certainly talks about principles and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And when we violate those principles, where, where does that fit into our judicial system? Uh, how do we address things that, that are happening that don't, may, may meet the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law? Right. Well, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, is basically the, the basic document uh, from where international human rights uh, emanate. But it's not a treaty, so it's not mandatory. Uh, many of its provisions are what is called uh, customary international law or even use cogens, which means an imperative norm of international law that no one, no one can violate. But the United States is also a signatory to human rights treaties, like the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Convention Against Torture, the four Geneva Conventions of 1949, the United States is a party to all of them. Now, do they actually become law of the land in the United States by virtue of their being ratified? Well, actually, the tendency by the Supreme Court has been to say that, by and large, those treaties are non-self-executing, which is a way of saying that, you, in addition to signing and ratifying, Congress has to pass what's called implementing legislation. But there is implementing legislation with respect to torture, there is implementing legislation with respect to genocide, that the United States is also a signatory. Uh, and by and large, for the rest, there's no need for implementing legislation because uh, things like, um, like uh, uh, arrest without trial are already prohibited by domestic law anyway in this country. So um, I think, in general, the, the US courts have been more or less inhospitable to bringing in uh, international human rights law uh, to bear in cases within the United States. But there's exceptions to that. For example, in, in, um, in one of these four cases, I think it's uh, Rasul, uh, the, the Supreme Court actually said that Common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions, which, uh, which says, among other things, because it's a long article, that people captured, uh, if they're going to be tried, they have to be tried by a court that offers guarantees of independence, independence and impartiality, were immediately binding on the United States, and the United States had to implement them. And therefore, decisions to uh, determine the status of a, of a prisoner by decision of the president alone were unconstitutional. The, the Supreme Court said that directly applying an international standard. And by, by the way, there there is also implementing legislation because the Uniform Code of Military Justice is the implementing legislation of the Geneva Conventions in this country. So although conservative scholars are gonna tell you that international law does not exist, there's plenty of examples in which the United States recognizes international law. If I'm a professor of international law, so I wish there were many more examples, but it's not like uh, it's non-existent by any means. One more, okay. Oh, you, no, I, uh, however many more, I'm not, uh, <laughs> go ahead. Well, I, I come from El Salvador, and the last year there was the coup in Honduras that's really worrying, and, and took us by surprise to all, the, to all Latin America. So I wanna know your opinion in that, and on the fact that there is an agreement to to start a truth commission uh, in Honduras, uh, but there are still many cases of obscure assassinations of activists against the coup. Uh, the last ones, uh, just the last week, two journalists were, were killed. And so how can a truth commission uh, be put in place uh, if there are still possible oh, no, violations to human rights going on? Yeah, uh, I, I, I thank you for bringing it up because I think the coup in Honduras uh, goes against the grain of the stability that I was saying. And it's a real blemish in the reputation, not only of Latin America, but I would say also of the United States because the reaction to the coup uh, was less than exemplary, especially by breaking 
the unanimity of uh, the OAS in resisting the coup and letting the Micheletti and the other plotters get away with it. Because in fact, they did get away with it. Um, and that's not to defend uh, Mr. Selaja, who but for a variety of reasons may have been good, bad, or indifferent president. But if we don't stand up for the principle that you have to finish your, your mandate, even if we don't like you, then the, the so-called Washington Charter on Democracy, which is a recent uh, 1994 uh, document signed by the United States and all members of the OAS, is meaningless. In addition, there were many human rights violations committed in the course of the coup and the month following the coup, and as you well put it, as recently as now. Uh, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights of the OAS has done a very good work of documenting and denouncing these violations. But if you undermine the OAS, you also undermine the human rights mechanisms of the OAS, including the commission and eventually the court. Um, I, don't, uh, I, I am not very confident on that truth commission because it seems to me to be one of those truth commissions that is offered as an alternative to serious work to serious prosecutions and investigations. And, um, and in fact, truth commissions that operate while the investigations are ongoing uh, are not a very good idea because you, know, uh, you have to have a, a certain um, peaceful situation in which the investigations can proceed without fear of retribution. And if the investigators for the truth commission are gonna be looking over their shoulders to see if they're going to be killed themselves, then the work is gonna be very difficult. Now, I'm not saying that uh, absolutely that Truth Commission is gonna be a failure, but I'm not very encouraged by the way it's being proposed and by whom and to do what, quite frankly. Uh, I would much prefer to make sure that the government of Mr. Lobo, who was elected after the coup, you know, kind of really take the bull by, 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 by its horns and look at violations that have happened since the coup uh, in a serious manner and letting the institutions of the country uh, perform their job, including the courts, obviously, and prosecutors. Nuria. Thank you. I have two questions for you, Professor. The first one is, in Argentina, NGOs play an important role for the enforcement of human rights, and which, is your, uh, which are your thoughts regarding the U.S., how NGOs will will act on this matter. And the second question is, do you believe that the reform of the UN um, human rights protection system, in, I think it was in 2006, and the replacement of the old Human Rights Commission for the Council, is it more effective right now? And it puts some leverage on, let's say, human rights enforcement? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, with respect to to the, the role of, the, of civil society and particularly human rights organizations, in Argentina, it was essential. It was crucial. They were very, uh, they, they carried a lot of moral high ground, but they were also very smart. Uh, and of course, with variations. But by and large, they benefited from very savvy political, you know, astuteness by some of its leaders, like Emilio Mignone, who unfortunately passed away some a dozen years ago, and others who really led the human rights movement into first starting very much in isolation. During the dictatorship, they were really very isolated. At the beginning of the democracy, they were respected because of what they had done, but they were not particularly popular. But gradually, they extended their agenda to all of society in, an, in a way that is really exemplary. Uh, I happen to think that in the United States, the human rights organizations of this country have also played a very, very important role. The ACLU, for example, um, but also the Center for Constitutional Rights, Human Rights Watch, Human Rights First, and several other organizations uh, have been at the forefront of resisting these invasions of the constitutional order from the start and have been uh, demanding uh, results uh, you know, uh, from day one, quite frankly. And I think to a large extent we have to thank them that things didn't, go, didn't get worse uh, because they could have, quite frankly. Um, now they are asking the Obama administration to do a lot more than the Obama administration is willing to do. But that's the nature of, of democracy. I mean, you, 
you go for broke and you ask for everything and you're disappointed uh, by your leaders, but, but eventually things do happen. And, and I am uh, at least among those who think that uh, there, may be, there, there may be things that I wish uh, the Obama administration did differently, but I'm not giving up hope or, or the effort to make sure that those things are done eventually, if not immediately. Uh, so, and, and I think for that, we have to rely on the civil society organizations. Now, your other question was about the Human Rights Council uh, that was created in 2006 after this more or less ill-fated reform of the United Nations proposed by Kofi Annan. I think the Human Rights Council in general has been a disappointment because although some of the reasons for getting rid of the old Human Rights Commission were very much uh, good reasons, the result has been not any better than the Commission and in some ways worse. For example, the Human Rights Council is much more uh, intent on cutting the wings of the independent uh, special procedures, like special rapporteurs, working groups on different themes and on countries. Than, uh, and and those, those special procedures and the treaty bodies had done a lot of very good work even uh, through the years of the commission, even though they didn't have the political support of the commission, but now they have the hostility of the council. And I think that's a step back or several steps back. On the other hand, I don't think we should just give up on the council. Uh, they have, they, it has some interesting features like the periodic review, which every country goes, comes up every four years to review. The United States is coming up at the end of the year and the Obama administration is doing a very interesting thing. It's, uh, it's doing um, kind of like town hall meetings all around the country in preparation for the report that the United States is going to write to the Human Rights Council, which is a very participatory way of you know, uh, deciding what to include in the report, uh, in, the, in the periodic review. And I think that's, a, that's an inter interesting concept that can be made to work a lot better than it works right now. But, you know, in the few years that it's been in place, uh, it's already more promising than we, than we had uh, expected at the beginning. Uh, but the main problem is the composition. Uh, you have a, a council to which regional blocks of countries re uh, determine regionally elect representatives, and it's almost inevitable that you're going to get if not a complete majority, a huge proportion of countries that are not interested in human rights. The, the Algerias of this world, the Cubas, the Libyas, the, the Ch China, uh, Sudan, you know, they are going, they're going to find their, a seat there. And if they have an important block, they're going to block initiatives uh, left and right. That's why the United States first decided not even to seek a seat at the Council. But I think it's a lot wiser what the Obama administration has done, which is to engage with the Council, uh, get a seat, uh, be elected, which is now a member, and uh, fight it out at the Council. Because disengaging from it, it just you know, leaves the road open for the enemies of human rights. And unfortunately, there are many of them uh, around the world and represented in international fora like the Human Rights Council. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks very much.